Hi, I'm Gordon Wettstein from Stanford University. And I lead the computational imaging group where we work on a number of different computational imaging and display technologies and applications, some of which relate to eye tracking. I'll tell you a little bit more today about uh, recent work that we've done on gaze contingent rendering displays and wearable computing systems, as well as really ultra low power and, and fast uh, eye tracking technology based on event sensors. So when people think about eye tracking in AR and VR, typically what comes to mind are things like foveated rendering, maybe user interfaces where you select objects or interact with the scene in other ways using the gaze, or maybe gaze contingent displays like very focal displays that provide more comfortable and visually realistic uh, depictions of, of a virtual environment. Now, I won't be talking too much about any of these today because I think we've heard a lot about those in the past. What I'd like to do is tell you a little bit more about some of the recent work we've been doing on modeling perception uh, in a gaze contingent manner in, in that are particularly important for AR and VR applications. I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the gaze contingent rendering systems we've been working on, including ocular parallax rendering and gaze contingent stereo. I'll tell you more about gaze contingent AR VR displays and uh, maybe more so even about wearable computing systems in general that can be enabled by eye tracking. And then lastly, I'd like to show you some of our recent work on ultra low power and super fast eye tracking using event sensors. So let's dive right in and talk a little bit about perceptual aspects. As a VR content creator, uh, you know, it's nowadays not too difficult to create photorealistic, fully immersive environments such as this indoor room. And while we feel uh, a sense of presence being in those, it may not always be easy to predict exactly how users will um, explore the scene or what they will actually be looking at. Are they gonna look at, you know, the photograph on the table, the couch, maybe what's on, on the dining table, uh, or down the hallway into the kitchen. It's difficult to model this simply because the visual environment is so large surrounding you in all dimensions. So to help people understand how users interact with and visually explore these types of environments, uh, a few years ago, my group set out to capture a reasonably large data set of uh, people exploring different types of visual scenes uh, by tracking their uh, ocular motion over time and recording you know, how the people look at and what they look at. So these data are extremely useful in helping us understand the saliency of objects in VR. Uh, so here, for example, you see a saliency map overlaid on the scene. And what you can see is that people typically look at, you know, faces, text, uh, you know, objects in the center of a table or the photograph there. Uh, these are all salient objects. So there's nothing too surprising in this particular photograph, but aggregated over lots of scenes, we can come up with very useful statistics that help us understand how people visually explore these types of scenes. Now, as I was saying, this is already a few years ago, we captured the first large scale data set of head and gaze trajectories in VR. Uh, and we ran a lot of statistical analyses on you know, inferring uh, visual behavior from these data. And a few of these insights that we made were uh, that you know, it doesn't actually take too long for users to explore a full 360 degree scene uh, on average, maybe 15 seconds. Uh, one thing that we found that wasn't super surprising is that there's a very strong equator bias. So people typically look uh, at the equator uh, most of the time, and they rarely look really up or down. They do, but not to the same degree as they look at the equator. And uh, you know what's also been extremely useful about having this data is that we can train, uh, for example, convolutional neural network-based uh, predictors to predict what may be salient in, in scenes that we haven't captured before. So this project really took off and uh, uh, was presented in 2017 by my former student, Vincent and uh, Anna Serrano. And it was really uh, the starting point for us to think about uh, you know, why is it important to model visual behavior in VR and AR also, and what, uh, what are some of the outstanding challenges still? Uh, more recently, we've been taking the same idea and bringing it to the next level by not only modeling what objects are salient in this specific scene. So saliency means that uh, your fixation uh, on this object will last for a time longer than some threshold, but there's really no temporal ordering to saliency. You don't know what a person will look at first and then after. So more recently, we've been working on generative adversarial models to predict the scan paths uh, of, of a user. So, and here I'm just playing back a few different scan paths over time that we can generate, you know, we can generate, uh, one, let, once trained, uh, our, our GAN can generate an arbitrary number of scan paths in very little time, maybe 10,000 of these in, in about uh, a second or so. And this is so useful because now we can simulate uh, virtual users and for your next uh, user experiment, you can recruit arbitrary number of subjects 
uh, if you have a scene layout, you could test that using uh, these generated scan paths. Or if you wanted to drive the uh, visual behavior and uh, motor uh, control of a digital character in a VR scene driven by its visual environment, you could use a scan path generator like this, which actually has the temporal ordering of, uh, of fixation points. So this is some work that we also did in collaboration with uh, folks at uh, the University of Zaragoza, and you can find that on the archive. Now, it is well known uh, that uh, foveated rendering is one of the big applications of uh, eye tracking in VR and AR. And the basic idea is that, you know, we have more photoreceptors in our fovea, so therefore the visual acuity is highest in the fovea, and it very rapidly drops off in the periphery. So if only we knew uh, what a point in the scene the, uh, the user fixates, uh, we could just render the image at variable resolution, thereby saving GPU cycles, uh, bandwidth, and, and latency. So this is well known, and it is also conventional wisdom, perhaps, uh, for those of us uh, who have thought about this more and read about it more, that the temporal resolution also varies over the uh, retina, but it doesn't vary in the same way as the acuity does. It is actually counterintuitive, but it turns out that the mid-periphery has a higher temporal resolution than the fovea. And so you can think about this as an anti-foveated effect to some extent, uh, but there haven't really been really great models to model this spatial temporal behavior and sensitivity of human perception. So earlier this year at SICRAF, uh, one of my PhD students, uh, Brooke Karajancic, uh, presented our recent work where we derived such a model that not only models the spatial acuity, as you can see on the left, but also the temporal acuity, the temporal resolution and sensitivity of the, the human visual system in a uh, manner that depends on the spatial frequency, eccentricity, and that predicts the critical, critical flicker fusion threshold. Compared to other perceptual models for foveated vision, ours is really the first that incorporates all these different aspects. So we model it based on uh, spatial frequency, uh, temporal statistics, based on eccentricity, and also on luminance. And the uh, experimental prototype we built to capture all of these data uh, is shown on the left where we basically build our own rig of a head-mounted display with a diffuse screen and a high-speed projector that uh, actually projects the image directly onto this diffuser so we can crank up the uh, refresh rate of the display by quite a lot. I'll just show you the, the main insights that we came up with. Uh, it's basically a plot or surface that you can see here, which uh, plots the, the highest temporal uh, frequency that we can perceive at any given spatial uh, frequency and eccentricity, which varies over the retina. So this describes an envelope of all the perceivable spatial temporal frequencies, and it's a really useful tool and model to discard you know, visual information that we don't perceive, and it is also setting us up to studying the critical, uh, the, the contrast sensitivity within that envelope in more detail. So if you're interested in these aspects, please uh, take a look at our recent SIGGRAPH paper. Another topic that we uh, have been working on for quite a while is uh, gaze contingent rendering. And I'm not talking necessarily about uh, foveated rendering here. That's a fairly well understood topic, even though there's more work to be done uh, thinking about the, the temporal aspects of it, uh, as I just alluded to. Uh, but one of the topics that we've been thinking about is seems very subtle, but actually turns out to be very interesting. So here's an interesting fact. Uh, the human eye has approximately at least it's some kind of a center of rotation. So as our gaze changes in different directions or we verge our eyeballs, it's gonna rotate around some center of rotation that we're gonna call C. But it actually turns out that the center of projection or the no parallax point inside the eye is not the same as the center of rotation, okay? So here we're depicting this by the front nodal point uh, of the thick lens model. So this is a common eye model. So there is an offset between the center of rotation and the center of projection, which is typically ignored in all rendering uh, approaches in VR, AR, and in general. Now, what, how does it matter that there is this offset? Uh, well, if you think about it, as we just look around a scene, our eye rotates in, in the eyeball, and because it rotates around the center of rotation and not around the center of projection, the center of projection actually shifts with the rotation of the eyeball, and what that creates is a very small amount of parallax, so depth-dependent shift of the scene that is known in the vision science community as ocular parallax. So there's a small amount of shift of these objects as we look around. Uh, the thing is, as we, as we know, uh, the resolution over the retina is variable. 
So there's a big question on whether we actually see this effect in practice or not. So what we did uh, with my student, former student Robert uh, was to explore this effect implemented in a VR headset uh, by basically using a commercially available eye tracking system um, and then track the user's eyes. So here you can see uh, a scene rendered that is eye tracked, but that does not have the ocular parallax disabled. So this is pretty much your conventional rendering system today. If we know where the user is looking at, we can actually shift the scene based on this very tiny offset between the center of rotation and uh, projection and uh, dial in this gaze contingent ocular parallax. If you look at the video, it actually looks like a large effect, uh, but keep in mind that the periphery of the user is actually rather blurred for the user. So they don't actually see the effect as pronounced in their periphery as we see, see that here. Okay, so this is kind of how it looks. Now, there are a, quick, a couple of questions that we were trying to answer with our original work. And the first one was, is this effect actually uh, visible in VR or is the effect size so small that it doesn't matter at all? And yes, the answer is yes, we can see it. And it turns out that the effect size is about the same as retinal blur. Now, what that means is that, you know, all these people, including myself, who've been talking about the virgin's accommodation conflict and, you know, the importance of getting the retinal blur rendered correctly are totally right in saying that and uh, doing a lot of research on it. But nobody has been talking about ocular parallax and how this may be important for AR and VR rendering, even though the perceptual effect size is the same as retinal blur. So it, you could say for the visual system, it's equally important. So we think this is a very exciting new direction. Uh, one thing we also tested was whether this uh, ocular parallax rendering increases the perceptual realism subjectively uh, for a few scenes that we showed to our users. And the answer was yes, it did in a significant way. Now, another interesting aspect uh, of this is here, we, uh, by the way, we studied the ocular parallax effect mostly in monocular viewing conditions, okay? So another interesting question arose was whether this ocular paradox effect could affect depth perception in some way. And the easiest way to think about this is in a stereoscopic scenario. And in a stereoscopic scenario, think about the two eyes as the eyes are verging, okay? So we all know what the interpupillary distance is, is the distance between, yeah, between what? Between the centers of rotation, between the centers of projection. Well, in conventional, uh, stereo rendering systems, we're just gonna assume that the IPD is the distance between the centers of rotation or the centers of projection as the eyes are verged at infinity. And so then they are the same really, right? So this is what's depicted here. The interpupillary distance is, is, is really the distance between these two points, the centers of the eye. But one thing that you will quickly realize if you think about uh, virgin's behavior, now that the eyes verge inwards as you're looking at an object close by, because the eyes do not rotate around their centers of, uh, of, of projection, but around the, the centers of rotation, the thing is that the interpupillary distance actually changes depending on the virgin state of the eye. So this is so interesting. Uh, and what we'd have to do in order to account for that in VR rendering is to uh, take the virgin's distance into account for our stereo rendering system and dynamically adjust it based on the virgins or on the gaze. And this is something that we explored with uh, my student Brooke uh, again at SIGGRAPH Asia in 2020. Uh, we ran a couple of simulations of how much you know, we would expect the incorrect stereo rendering of all existing stereo displays to distort the disparities. And it turns out it really does change in a maybe non-insignificant way. It's small, but it is not insignificant. Uh, the question again is, does it make a difference or not? And here we just show uh, the amount of disparity distortion on the right that depend on the actual gaze point. So you really have to adjust this uh, based on the, on the gaze point or of the virgin's distance. Now we ran a couple of user studies, uh, one scenario in VR, one scenario in AR. Uh, and I just wanna briefly go over these results. So on the left, we did a, an experiment in VR where we showed the user uh, a test stimulus that is hard to see. Uh, here's, a, here's an anaglyph of that. It's kind of like a folded piece of paper and we measured the amount of distortion and depth that the user would see. And we compared our method, the gaze contingent method, over a user-defined fine-tuned stereo with fixed IPD system. And what we can see is that we achieve a significant, uh, significant improvement in the depth perception for objects close by. When objects are farther away, it doesn't really matter that much because the eyes will verge farther away. And uh, you know, the effective IPD is very close to whatever you assume anyways. So this makes a difference if you have scenes 
uh, that have a large depth range or objects very close by. Perhaps more importantly, in AR, or especially optical see-through AR, we often want to anchor digital objects to physical objects and make sure that they appear seamless with these physical objects. Now, that also implies that the perceived depth of these objects is constant and anchored to the real world. But we know what we just said that, you know, uh, the actual disparities perceived by the user actually depends on the gaze. So the question is, how much does that affect things? So here we're showing, so we did a, an experiment with the HoloLens. Uh, the head is completely uh, mounted at a fixed position together with the HoloLens. And we're looking at a couple of cards comparing a, physically, a physical and a digital target. Uh, and what we're going to do is compare the uh, accuracy of the depth rendering of a couple of different display modes. So HoloLens out of the box is a general purpose stereo renderer that may not have the exact right IPD, or maybe there's some calibration issue. So we're actually letting the user uh, adjust the, uh, their own IPD based on a couple of test stimuli. And that is basically a per user per use calibration of, the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of their IPD. And what we found is that this uh, really cumbersome stereo calibration, which wouldn't be practical, is significantly better in all cases over the HoloLens mode that comes out of the box. Now, uh, but we use this fine-tuned method as the baseline to compare against our gaze contingent mode. And again, we find the same thing that for objects that are very close by, we're going to see a very large effect on the perceived uh, correct distance, uh, and people uh, get the, the they can judge the distance of an object much, with much more confidence and accuracy uh, with the gaze contingent stereo rendering mode than not. Again, for objects that are farther away, it doesn't really matter because the effect of a gaze contingent IPD and and the out of the box IPD are actually fairly similar. Okay, I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, and uh, it could be a really simple way to enhance the perceptual realism and depth perception of VR and AR systems if only you had reliable eye tracking in there. Okay, let me talk a little bit about gaze contingent uh, displays for VR, AR. A lot has been said about these topics in the past, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, but I do want to talk about uh, other wearable computing systems that could equally benefit from uh, eye tracking. Now, probably most of you know that you know, VR is a new technology, but it is based on old principles. Uh, for example, the stereoscope was invented more than 150 years ago by Charles Wheatstone, others around the same time. And people in these Victorian times would gather and look at stereoscopic photographs uh, and enjoy those. Now, today, uh, you know, Facebook and other companies have made a tremendous progress in the technology development. Uh, and in fact, the National Academy of Engineering of the US has declared enhancing virtual reality one of the grand challenges of the 21st century. So this is such an interdisciplinary challenge where lots of different technologies have to come together and eye tracking is one of them. Now, one challenge that people have looked at and my lab uh, also in particular is this idea of creating correct focus cues in VR or AR. Uh, typic typical VR displays are based on this magnifier principle which is basically trivial. You put a magnifying lens in front of a small display like your phone or another micro display. And what the magnifying lens does is it creates a magnified virtual image of this, uh, of this screen. And that is at a fixed distance. With a fixed focal length lens and a fixed distance between the micro display and the lens, you're gonna create this virtual image at a fixed distance. And so what both eyes are looking at is a plane each floating in front of you at some fixed distance. This is not like the real world. In the real world, we look around and our eyes freely accommodate or focus at, at the depth of the object. But in VR and AR, at least for these simple magnifier designs, uh, the accommodation state of our eye is fixed to this virtual image of the display. Now, this is a problem because the lack of focus cues can lead to what's known as the vergence accommodation conflict, where we can verge at arbitrary distances based on the render disparities, but our accommodation is fixed at a fixed plane. And that can have uh, different consequences for different people. Uh, eye strain is one of them, potential visual discomfort, other things or others. Lots has been said about this, so I don't want to go too much into detail, even though my lab has worked on this quite a bit. Um, we have explored a number of different technologies over the last maybe six years or so, uh, starting from gaze contingent, very focal displays to near eye light field displays. More recently, we've been focusing quite a bit on holographic near eye displays that use coherent light and face modulators. But unfortunately, I don't have enough time to tell you more about this. You can go to our website to learn more about it. Uh, I just want to briefly mention that I think that gaze contingent very focal displays are probably one of the most promising solutions in this case, simply because 
they, first of all, they are eye tracking enabled and dynamically drive the focal plane of the displays wherever the fixated object is at whatever depth the fixated object is. So it's a fairly simple idea, which we prototype quite a bit using uh, very focal lenses, uh, dynamically adjustable focal planes, eye tracking in 2016, 2017. Facebook also demonstrated their own technology at the F8 developer conference in 2018. So this is a fairly active area of research and simply it works. It, it's very effective. We've done a lot of user studies with hundreds of users and it really drives the accommodation of a young user in a natural way. Okay, so why do I say young user? <laughs> well, we need to understand the accommodation behavior of the user a little bit. And we also need to think about their age a little bit more if we want to develop effective uh, focus cues. So now when people talk about normal vision, they typically talk about a young person uh, who, can, who has a certain acuity and who can accommodate over a certain range. Uh, such as you know, from optical infinity to some distance close by. You can check how far you can accommodate by just holding your hand in front of your eye and try to move it as close as you can while you still see a sharp image. You know, that distance will get farther and farther away as you get older. But the, the way we accommodate our eyes is uh, that the liquid lens in the eye is basically uh, actuated by the ciliary muscles uh, that kind of deform the lens, the crystalline lens in the eye. And then people think about nearsightedness and farsightedness as uh, challenges, but they're actually not too bad. In, in these cases, we have the accommodation range simply being uh, shifted forwards or back, and we can easily correct that using fixed focus prescription glasses. Uh, so I'm nearsighted, I put on my glasses, my accommodation range is shifted back into the normal range. Not a problem. The problem is really, as we get older, uh, our crystalline lens stops to be able to deform. And this is because there's a protein that builds up that makes the lens stiff. So people simply cannot accommodate anymore. You typically can only accommodate or focus at a far distance. Now, presbyopia can be coupled with nearsightedness and farsightedness, but again, the myopia and hyperopia, you can easily correct uh, using fixed focal lenses. But the problem is really that the, the range of accommodation is so small. So let me just make that really clear for everybody who may have not experienced it, because maybe you're just too young. So as a young person, you can look around a scene and you can freely accommodate your eye uh, on the fixation point, whether it's close or far. And th what that means is you can see all objects sharply if you just look at them. If you think about a presbyope, uh, so an amotropic presbyope who can accommodate to the far distance, they can see the far distance just fine, but they can't read anything that's close simply because their eye cannot deform in a way that brings the near distance in focus. So they need to wear a special prescription pair uh, for reading. And those are typically reading glasses. So reading glasses you can put on, they shift your accommodation range forward uh, and you can read, but at the same time, you lost the ability to see far with the reading glasses. So if you wanna use reading glasses, you have to put them on when you read. And as soon as you look up, you have to take them off again because you get only one plane in focus at the same time. Maybe the more uh, you know, versatile solution are progressive glasses. These are glasses that have a varying focal power over, over, the, over the glasses. So now we, we allocate different corridors or different regions of the glasses to different uh, focal powers. So when we look through the top part of the glass, we can see far. If we look through the bottom, we can see close. And this is really, you know, pretty good solution uh, because you can get all of it in the same pair of glasses. But the problem is that we sacrifice the visual field for each one focal distance. Also, as you walk down the stairs, you're going to look down and it turns out that progressive glasses increase the ability or the pro probability of people falling because as you look down, you think that you're gonna see the steps, but instead you're corrected for near vision and you don't know where you're stepping. So progressive glasses can be fairly bad in many scenarios. There are other more exotic solutions that put HI at a different focal plane that I don't wanna talk about too much, but none of these really mimics the natural solution. The natural solution is an automatic way uh, of driving the accommodation of your eyes using your gaze. So as you look at different objects, they come into focus and out of focus. And none of these existing eyeglasses uh, solve this. So recently, a number of variable focus lens technologies have become available, including mechanically shifting Alvarez lenses, liquid lenses, liquid crystal lenses that can be electronically tuned. And these can be driven in a dynamic way to allow you to you know, <coughs> change the focal power of the entire lens at once. We call this solution, which is a gaze-driven uh, automatic focusing uh, pair of eyeglasses, autofocals. And we built some early prototypes that are fairly big, as you can see here, 
uh, and they consist of a couple of different technologies. So we have a binocular eye tracker that mainly tracks the virgin state of the eye. Uh, we have a depth camera. In this case, it's not really necessary to have this depth camera. We had it in our prototype then that takes a picture of the scene in front of the user uh, with a depth map. We have a focus tunable lens that's very large to give us a large field of view. Uh, and then we have some uh, optics uh, aberration correction in here to give the user good visual acuity too. <coughs> so what this pair of eyeglasses does is uh, it allows you to track the, the accommodation state of the user, uh, not the accommodation state, sorry, the virgin state of the user, which basically gives you the gaze depth. And we dynamically adjust the focal plane of, the, of these eyeglasses based on the gaze depth. So as the user looks at the father object, the, the box here, that comes in and out of focus. And as the user looks at the teapot, that comes in and out of focus. And we run a lot of user studies with that, demonstrating that um, we can improve the visual acuity over uh, certain types of uh, prescription, um, for example, a monovision, uh, and we can improve visual task performance over progressives uh, and, <clears throat> and also enable depth, better depth perception. So we believe autofocus is the future uh, of uh, digital eyewear. And there's no display in there, so it's not really AR or VR, but it is a wearable computing system that is enabled by, in part at least, by eye tracking. Okay, but why don't we have eye tracking in all AR and VR displays today? Well, there are a number of challenges, even though eye tracking seems like, you know, compared to some of the other technology challenges in AR or VR, fairly straightforward, but it is not. And it's not for several reasons. What we see today mostly are near eye systems. So those are small cameras mounted close to the eye that uh, maybe operate at, you know, maybe 120 to 200 Hertz maximum. Uh, that's already fairly fast. And that have an accuracy of about you know, 0.5 to one <clears throat> degrees. So these systems work fairly well, um, but they're not good enough for vision science experiments. So vision scientists actually use completely different systems that are desk mounted, for example, to a monitor like iLink, that's kind of like your, your reference eye tracking system. And those types of systems really operate at, you know, order of magnitude, faster speeds and fairly good accuracy as well. Simply because you need that speed to capture the most subtle eye motions. <clears throat> the problem is that these desk mounted systems are large, power hungry, and they're not wearable. So they're not really useful for wearable computing systems. So we have this dilemma where we have these low performance systems that can operate in a small form factor and at low power or reasonably low power and these desk mounted systems that have the performance we want but they're just too large power hungry and also too expensive fit. <coughs> Again, the reason why we actually need fast eye tracking is because a lot of the more interesting things actually happen in you know less than 10 milliseconds. The eye has some of the fastest moving muscles in the human body. They're contracting in less than 10 milliseconds. So the speed is really crucial for these eye tracker uh, trackers and to properly measure the fastest and most subtle movements of the eye, like microsaccades, we basically have to enable uh, temporal sampling rates of you know, a thousand times per second or more, ideally. Now, let's maybe go to the extreme of something like 10,000 frames per second. Is that even possible? Well, let's say we have a camera with 300 by 300 pixels and captures eight bits per pixel, like a grayscale system operating in near infrared perhaps, uh, and it's supposed to run at 10,000 frames per second. Well, if you do the numbers, the bandwidth of this camera <coughs> is extremely large. This type of a camera would require 7.2 gigabits per second, which far exceeds even the bandwidth offered by USB 3. Okay, so that it, it's simply not possible to run a camera at this rate unless you have some kind of a dedicated high speed link, which is not really something that you want on a you know, low power wearable uh, display setting. Now, so here we, on the right, we have a plot that plots frames per second versus bits per second. And the green horizontal bar is the bandwidth of USB 3. Existing systems offer, well, not very high speeds. And we built what we believe to be the first extremely high speed system that is in a wearable form factor. And it's based on a trick or a clever insight, I would call it. The insight is this. Typical cameras record an intensity image that you can see on the left. And there's a lot of pixels with information there that you all have to record, uh, digitize with your analog to digital converter, and then transmit off the chip in order to process it later. Sorry. The thing is, if we look at the temporal differences between these frames on the right, 
we can see that the signal is actually sparse most of the time. So there is a ton of redundancy in this data. Uh, but how does it matter that the temporal difference between frames doesn't contain much information? Well, it turns out that there's this emerging type of sensor known as an event sensor that records exactly this temporal difference, but not in a frame by frame manner, but in an event based manner where we only read out events that are not sparse in, in this data stream. So to help you understand what that means is here's a desk mounted uh, event sensor. What this records when we hold it close to an eye looks kind of like this stream on the right. We read out events that are most dense whenever there is actual ocular motion and whenever nothing moves or in other parts of the scene, we don't actually see anything. It just reads out these events and the different colors here are the polarities. Whenever the uh, temporal changes above a certain threshold or below the negative threshold. So <clears throat> there are even uh, event cameras that can uh, read out events and also frames. So they are like hybrid cameras that can read out conventional frames at a certain rate, let's say maybe 30 or 60 frames per second. But in between, they can still read out these, these events at you know uh, rates that are well above 10,000 frames per second or so. And we captured somebody moving their eye in exactly with exactly that kind of a camera. And here you can see our recorded data. Uh, this is just the raw data of the frames of the eye at some temporal interval uh, with the events in between. And so what this allows us to do is process these events jointly between the time when we record frames in addition to the frames. So this is really exciting because what we can do now is you know take the stream of frames that comes in at low frame rate, take the stream of events that comes in at a very high frame rate, uh, we developed a super power efficient online least square system that fits an eye model, uh, something like an ellipse, uh, also these uh, uh, Purkinje reflections. And we also have a, a tracking system for the eyelashes. Uh, and we basically fit the gaze point in real time <clears throat> at frame rates up to 10,000 frames per second or and beyond even that. So again, here you can see how that kind of looks like. Here's our pupil fitting system. Uh, it doesn't just fit the pupils at the frames, but also in between. We can kind of stretch out the time here, and you can see that there is some curvature in between these frames that it captures. So that means we, we can really get valuable information of the ocular motion uh, at this rate. Here's a real-time system that you can see. Uh, this is a desktop-mounted system where we have a user following a mouse pointer. Uh, there's quite a bit of latency in the monitor itself. So that's why you know, we, see, we see the rendered gaze point with a little bit of latency behind uh, the mouse pointer. But the eye tracking system itself and the pupil fitting runs at the frame rates that I just mentioned, which is incredible and you know much better than even these desk mounted systems uh, like the iLink. Yes, yet another video. <clears throat> so this system simply works. And I'll refer you to the paper that we published at IEEE VR earlier this year for more technical details. Uh, these event sensors are also getting smaller. So we even built a wearable system. It's not, it's, it's not tiny yet, but it is very small and wearable and it gives us a similar type of performance. Now, this concludes the part uh, where I talk about our past research at uh, Stanford, and we're continuing to push the frontiers of displays, rendering, perceptual models, and eye tracking there. Uh, but I'm also deeply involved with a startup called ZinLabs. I'm one of the co-founders, along with some of my former students working in this space. And at ZinLabs, we're uh, excited to push the frontier of all-day low-power eye sensing in tiny form factors, uh, enabling applications like the ones I mentioned earlier uh, and beyond uh, at technical capabilities and at power levels that are unprecedented uh, in this community. So uh, I can't tell you more about this right now, but please stay tuned. Uh, lots of exciting technology coming out of Zen Labs. So with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and thank the organizers for inviting me to be part of this wonderful workshop. I'd like to thank all my students and postdocs and collaborators for doing a lot of the work that I presented today. You can find uh, detailed project websites, videos, uh, technical papers on all the topics that I mentioned today on our website, computationalimaging.org. And I hope we have a few minutes left for a Q&A session. So thanks again, and uh, it's great to be here today.